My journeys brought me to Glasgow, Scotland's second city. I'm in what's called the Merchant City, a grid of streets in the old town where once the merchants lived who made Glasgow rich. These portly, gouty men in their periwigs with their powdered, puffed up wives form the focus of the next chapter of this empire story. And this part of the story is not about conquest or colonization or the spread of so-called civilization. It's about commerce, trade. Now, to make sense of this, we've got to get a handle on life back at the start of the 18th century. And this is a period of British history that's always made me smile, because the people back then seemed so like us today. Forget the silly clothes, forget the silly wigs. These were modern Britons with all our flaws and imperfections. They loved celebrity, they loved scandal, they loved gossip. And the place they loved to hang out in was Starbucks. Well, not Starbucks exactly, but coffee shops. They were a craze in the 18th century. They were everywhere. And in these coffee shops, what did they do? They consumed the latest foreign goods. First, tobacco. Not as cigarettes, they smoked pipes. Second, another drug, coffee. They shifted it back. Tea, ditto, and last but not least, spoonful after spoonful of sugar. The British sweet tooth was famous. Now, what connected these goods, apart from the fact that they were all bad for us, is that none of them could be grown here in Britain. Tobacco and sugar came from the New World, from America and the West Indies. Coffee and tea came from the East Indies, from India and China, which meant that there were fortunes to be made now, heading out and growing this stuff, or buying it, shipping it back, selling it on. It was these trade goods that stimulated the early growth of the British Empire. And it was tobacco and sugar, in particular, that made Glasgow rich. In 1707, the Act of Union passed between England and Scotland gave Glasgow's merchants the right to trade in English trading ports abroad. And they grasped that opportunity. They sailed west, around the top of Ireland. Across the Atlantic, they bartered with English planters growing sugar in the Caribbean and they cornered the market in tobacco grown by the colonists in Maryland and Virginia. And back they sailed, up the Clyde to Greenock, where sugar and tobacco was offloaded onto wharves and sold onto markets in Glasgow and beyond. Now you might think at last we found an example of empire without exploitation, all right, where nobody suffers. Brits sail abroad, they found plantations, merchants sail over, they buy their produce, they ship it home. This is just trade, just business, right? Wrong. And I want to tell a story that illustrates the flip side of this Atlantic trade, and it concerns just one Glasgow tobacco lord, a man called George Buchanan. He was no one exceptional. There are countless examples of men like Buchanan from Glasgow, from Liverpool, from Bristol. All right, so, Buchanan. He was a prosperous merchant. He ran a company called Buchanan and Simpson, trading tobacco directly between America and Glasgow. But then in 1761, he realized he could do even better, and so he diversified. He didn't sail to America, he went to Africa, to the Gold Coast. And there he bought 300 Africans as slaves for 25 pounds each. He shipped the slaves to Maryland. He traded them for tobacco. The tobacco he shipped back to Glasgow, the slaves remained in America, torn from their homes, their families, treated now as possessions, worked sometimes even to death. In all, 10 million Africans were shipped as slaves across the Atlantic. Three million of them in British ships. And our wealth in the 18th century depended upon this obscene exploitation of human beings for profit. And for a hundred years, we shut our eyes to their suffering. Why? Because we wanted sugar in our coffee. Because we fancied a smoke.